والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulullah. This is Yusuf Estes, and we're talking on the subject in our series about clearing the fog, removing the misconceptions and misunderstandings that many people have concerning Islam and the teachings of Islam. In clearing this fog, it's the responsibility of the Muslims to properly present our case. Many times we have a specific question, which is very harsh in its manner and nature, often attacking Islam and the things that Islam stands for. So it's important for us, first of all, to know the answer to the question, of course, but at the same time to realize what is the methodology or the menhaj for answering the question in the proper way, according to Islam. Of course, we're going to say it's based on the Qur'an and the teachings of Muhammad called the Hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, I want to give an example of a question in this particular series today and see what you would say if somebody asked you this. They come to you and they say, you're a Muslim. You say, yes, I'm Muslim. Okay, we heard about your God. Your God's called Allah, right? You say, yes. Well, you said this God is where? And how do you worship this God? Because what we've observed from television and in magazines and newspapers is that there's this black box out in the desert. And it looks like you guys are bowing down to this black box. So we want to know, do you guys really worship a black box in the desert? Well, that's a good question. And how would you answer that? This is what we're going to be talking about in this segment. To begin with, inshallah, we as Muslims know that we have a responsibility to provide the best possible answer in the best possible way. And this is for me, you, and all of us to be able to properly deal with the question. Even a question when you don't know the answer, you still have to attempt to give some understanding to remove this fog of misunderstanding. And we do so by telling them this statement, thank you for asking me about my religion. That's very important to let them know that you are as concerned as they are about their interest in Islam. And they'll be surprised because they were expecting you were going to come back with no, yes, you know, some kind of rebuttal. But instead, what you're going to be saying to them is, thank you for asking me about my religion. And they're going to go, huh? The next thing you would do is mention to them that in Islam, we must say the truth. This is very essential. We always say the truth. If we don't, we can go to hell forever. So it's not an option for us. We're not allowed to lie. As a matter of fact, it's considered a correct answer in Islam if I say, I don't know. Because if I don't know, it's better to say that than to make up something, isn't it? So Allah gives a reward to the ones who say, I don't know. I don't know. And then, after we've communicated to them the idea that we have to tell the truth, the next thing is to tell them we have the proof. Everything in Islam is authenticated, recorded, and preserved for 1,400 years. And this is not by accident. Allah has preserved this deen or way of life for Muslims so that we today know what Islam was teaching even 1,400 years ago, and it's still applicable today in our real life. Let's go back to that particular question and examine it a little bit. If somebody came to you and said, why do you Muslims worship a black box in the desert? That's usually the way a harsh question comes. It comes with a statement in it that's not true. So we get rid of the harsh statement first and tell them that that's not correct. We don't worship a black box in the desert. But if your question is, who do we worship, then we're most happy to tell you who we worship. And why the focus on this black box in the desert, the Kaaba, what we're talking about there? Now, that's a fair question, and we would like to answer that. But by the way, when we're giving you the answer to the question, if you find yourself saying, gee, that's nice, I like that for me, or any of the things that we say seem to go along with your own nature and what you already believe, then are you going to be prepared to consider your position? and begin to worship your Lord without any partners? Because you see, that's what Islam is really all about. It's about worshiping God, the one God of the universe, 
with no partners. At that stage, they're going to be saying, what? Because you're going to take them aback a bit. They're going to say, what's he talking about? Sounds like he's trying to convert me or something. And in fact, we're not. We're not trying to convert anybody, but what we're trying to do here is to present the clear message. When we do that, then the people begin to understand what Islam really is about. Oftentimes, Muslims themselves have a difficulty because they don't know and they don't know who to ask or where to turn for the answers. Now, of course, this is a part of the reason for this series called Lifting the Fog. Somebody asks you about our worship in general, it's always to explain the Rabbil Alameen. What do I mean? When we talk about Allah, we have something very beautiful in Islam. We have the word for God. You don't have it in English. I'm going to tell you that up front. There is no word in English for the real God. The word in English for God is the same as it is for a false God. Anything worshipped in English is a God. In Arabic, the word for God is Elah, not Allah. Anything worshipped is a God. A rock, a stick, a stone, a bone, anything that people can see, hear, smell, touch, feel, can be worshipped. And that's a God or an Elah. In English, you spell it G. O D, But in English, when you want to talk about the one almighty God of Abraham and Adam and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, we're talking then about Allah. But you don't have that in English. You say, yes, we do. We just put a big G. Well, if you're starting the sentence out, you have to put a big G anyway, so you wouldn't know if you're talking about God, the God, or God, a God. In Arabic, it's real simple because the word Allah doesn't need to be capitalized. In fact, there are no capital letters in the Hebrew, Aramaic, or Arabic language. It's very clear when you say Allah who you're talking about. The question now has presented an opportunity for us to discuss exactly who we worship and why. And then let them make the comparison in their own minds to what they've considered to be worship or a God in their own head according to their own religious background. What we say here is the description of the word Elah. Elah is something worshipped, anything worshipped. Auliha, that is the plural, gods. You put an S after the word God and you have gods. And that's Auliha in Arabic. But when you say Allah, there is no word like this in the English language. The closest they can come is to try to capitalize the G. But whenever you start a sentence, you capitalize a word anyway, so you wouldn't know if you started the sentence and it says God, if you're talking about a false God, a real God, a pagan God, or whatever is worshipped. With Arabic, it's clear because when you say Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha, it's Allah. And Allah is the proper name for God of Islam. This is the name for the God of Adam and Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and Jesus. And by the way, Moses is known to us as the progenitor of the same religion of Abraham, just as Jesus is the continuation of the message that came with the prophets before him, and just as Muhammad is the one continuing this message. This is not something new. This gives us the opportunity to talk about that as well. In our other programs, we've discussed in detail about the word Allah. But just for the sake of this one, I will touch on it again. Allah is not plural, and it has no gender. It's not male and not female. When Allah says he in the Quran, he's not referring to himself as male, but rather out of respect and dignity. There is not a she, nor really a he, when we talk about Allah, because Allah is much more than something compared to his creation. The other thing is, when it says us or we in the Quran, Allah is referring to himself in the royal capacity, not in plural. There is none with Allah. He has no partners. So, obviously, there's not two or three or four. If we understand this, it helps us in presenting the correct message here about the oneness of God. So now we have an opportunity to talk about the Tawheed or monotheism of Islam. So through the question, when they say, what do you worship? Whether they say, did you worship a black box or who is Allah? Regardless of the question, it gives us the opportunity to expound on it, to open up who is Allah and how do we worship Him. The name itself means the only one worthy to be worshipped. That is Allah's name. And it works really nice when we break it down and show them how they can understand this. Now, when we talk about our comparison to what they have, it's important for us to remember we should never attack their beliefs. And we don't need to attack them. 
Let them hear what we have and let them make their own assessment. That's strong enough. When you show the truth of Islam, you don't need to attack somebody else's belief. They'll attack it themselves. The common sense, God is one. He has no partners. For a person who follows the Judaism, the religion of Jewish, or for the Christian, they say God is one. This is in their book. It actually says to them real clear, to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, one Lord. It also tells them that you shall not make any partners with God. Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. All of this points in the same direction that Islam is talking about one God. So this is very important. Another thing that we find is that they'll ask you, what about this God you have, this Allah? Is that the same God of Abraham? Uh, we don't think so. They'll say that. They'll say we don't believe it because uh, this is not the God of the Bible. This is not the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. Some have even argued that this is something that was made up later. There was no word Allah until Muhammad Sallallahu came along and made it up. Uh, this actually in some scholarly works presented, not Muslim of course, in the West. But in fact, there's a simple answer for that. There are Arab Jews today and there are Arab Christians just as there were at the time of Muhammad Islam, and just as there were at the time of Jesus. Peace and blessing be upon him. I want you to think about this. If there's a Bible in the Arabic language, what would be the word that they use for God? That would prove it right there. And by the way, I have two. And you're welcome to check it out for yourself. You can go to any hotel or motel in the West, and there's a free Bible placed there by the Gideon Society. Take it out, open it up. In the very beginning of it, they're real proud of the fact that they've translated this word, God, and the message of God into all these different languages. The first language that they give an example of is the Afrikaans language. The second one they give an example of is called the Arabic language. And you can see it for yourself because they're translating the verse from John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world, etc. You read it right there in the Arabic and it says it, Allah. Alif Lam Lam Ha. The same is true of the Old Testament for the Jews. And I have looked at it myself. And on page one in the book of Genesis, I counted the word Allah 17 times. So if this is something new, it's made up, how come it's there in the Jewish book? How come it's already there in the Christian book? And in fact, this is the same name that was used by Jews and Christians at the time of Muhammad. And it was understood that when they said Allah, they meant the one and only God. This was clear to them as it should be to all of us. Now, this gives us a chance to introduce the subject of who is Allah. The next thing that we're going to be talking about is how do we worship Him. So we want you to stay tuned with us here on Clearing the Fog, Lifting the Fog, Getting Rid of the Misconceptions of Islam and the message that comes with it. Stay tuned for more right here. My name is Shrifi Tuni and this is brought to you from Huda TV. Um, in today's edition we'll be discussing about uh, the day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala equated the samawat with darkness, the firmament with darkness, and equated the earth with light. Why? Are there really pillars that cannot be seen? Or is it an unseen uh, pillar? Everything is running, but the relationships are fixed. Yes. So that it would appear to people as if nothing is running, you see. We are destroying the, our environment with our own hands. And that's why the Quran says, ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. This is the second part of our program in dealing with the subject of clearing away these misconceptions or lifting the fog with regard to the subject of who do we actually worship. And I want to give you now the example of what really did happen to us one time with this question about Muslims worshiping a black box in the desert. I was giving a talk similar to the one that I've been talking about here in a masjid in Toronto, Canada. After the talk, a gentleman came up to me and he said, listen, I want to ask you a question. Why is it you Muslims worship this black box in the desert? And I said, whoa, let's start from the beginning. And I actually went through the steps and asked the Muslims to listen how we answer the question. And I said to him, thank you for asking us about our religion. 
First of all, in Islam, we must always tell the truth. Because if we don't, we can go to hell forever. The second thing is that we have the proof. Everything in Islam is recorded, it's documented, and it's preserved in authentic form so that there's no question about what was really taught 1,400 years ago. And finally, a lot of times we have to clear up the question before we can answer it because it may contain within it something that's, well, incorrect. So we'll begin with that. And by the way, while you're listening to the answer, if you hear something that you said, gee, I didn't know that, or if you find yourself saying, gee, I like that for me, this is something nice, and I can relate to that, then my question to you would be, are you going to be prepared then to consider worshiping your Lord and your God alone without any partners? Because you see, that's all Islam is really about anyway. The gentleman looked at me and he said, huh? I said, yes. I'm just telling you that while you listen to the answer, if you find things that you really like, are you going to be prepared then to consider worshiping God, your God, on his terms? That's what Islam is about. He said, okay, go ahead. So then I give him the answer. And I began like this, by explaining that first and foremost, who is Allah? As we mentioned in the first part of the segment of this particular program today, we talked about who is Allah and why we worship him alone. He has no partners. Then I came to the part about the black box. The black box is actually a place in the desert that's been constructed a long time ago and then maintained for century after century by the various tribes and descendants of Ishmael. He was surprised to learn that we know about Ishmael. I said, oh, of course. You see, Islam is teaching us about the sons of Abraham. Abraham has two sons, Ishak, or Isaac, as you call him, and Ismail, or Ishmael, as is mentioned in the Bible. These two sons are both descendants of Abraham. And both of them are predicted in the Bible to have many generations, many, many, many of their children, as many as the sand of the sea and as many as the stars in the heaven. And this is comparing one to the other. He agrees with me. He goes, yeah, and? I said, okay. So just in the same way that we realize that Isaac had many, many, many descendants that came from him. And these are the ones that are referred to as the chosen to receive guidance or the Yahud. So in the same way is Ishmael or Ismael. He has also many descendants. When Abraham took his son Ishmael to the desert with his mother, who we call her Hajar and you call her Hagar in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. When they went to the desert, there was a place there, a specific place that was built up, that they built upon it, this house of Allah, or Kaaba. And this has been maintained ever since until this very day. He said, oh, I didn't know that. I said, well, it's okay. Let me explain, too, that that's not the only house of Allah. There were other places where people worshipped God. And the Old Testament is famous for mentioning these booths that were set up for the prophets to worship there in these particular places. One of the most famous that you may be familiar with is Jerusalem itself. When people used to all face toward Jerusalem and Jews today still face toward Jerusalem for their worship. Now, there's another one in the New Testament. You may not be familiar with it by its correct name in Arabic, but you'll recognize it right away with the English version. Bethlehem. Beit Lehem. Which means what? It's meaning a slaughterhouse. The house of flesh or meat. And that was where Jesus, peace be upon him, was born. was into this city, which was well known for its slaughterhouses. So, this gives us an idea now that sometimes we hear words that we think that are some kind of sacred thing. And it's just explaining a place. And the same is true for the place that we worship God in the desert, you call it the black box or the cube, and we're saying that we don't worship God there in it, but we direct our worship to God by facing that way. But it's different than the icons that we hear about in the Catholic Church. An icon is something that you worship to get to God. You go through this to get to Him, and we don't do that. That is not the purpose of the Kaaba. It's a place for us to direct our devotion as in lining up, as in being in organized lines, but the heart is directly worshiping Allah without going through a box or through anybody. We don't worship through that, nor do we worship through the one standing in front of us called the Imam. We don't, our prayers don't go through him either, but rather this is to give us all direction, and that's the main purpose behind it. 
Because Allah tells us in the Quran itself that it is not piousness or righteousness that you are turning your faces to the east or to the west. But righteousness is that what? That you have this right attitude and belief in God and a pure heart and you're dedicating that heart to Him. This is the meaning behind it. And so once we understand that, then we realize that we're not worshiping anything on this earth, whether it is a man, a rock, a stick, a stone, or anything. Keep in mind that this is the same place in the desert where Ishmael and his father Abraham went to worship. And they performed certain anasik or rituals that were carried forward even by their descendants and finally to Muhammad. It's not something new and it's well established. And by the way, there's also a story amongst the Israeliat, which means the stories from Israel, previous generations, talking about that when Adam and Eve first were put out of the Jannah or the paradise, that this is the place where Adam went to make his prostration. This is where Adam went to put his head down on the ground and ask for forgiveness for having eaten the fruit. And certainly, if that's a true story, that is an amazing place a wonderful place for us to turn our direction and ask forgiveness from Allah by putting our heads down on the ground and asking Allah to forgive us. It's not so much the place, it's the attitude. And our attitude is one of gratitude. As Muslims, we put our head down on the ground to the Almighty, the one above. And in this position with the head on the ground, lowering ourselves in front of Him, then we have done the most amazing thing. The human being who considers himself so proud and arrogant lowers himself before the Lord of the worlds, puts his head on the ground and asks him, O oh God, forgive me. Forgive me and have mercy on me. So this really gives us a chance to understand the marker, the place where we all face. We don't worship that, but we worship the God that created that and everything else. And we line up all together, uniting our hearts and our worship. And we all face the same direction wherever we are in the world. And this is something amazing that you only find in Islam. Because once a year, every year, the Muslims gather at this place, the Kaaba, in Mecca, to worship the Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of the Worlds. We go there and we perform these rituals. And this is to remember and commemorate what Abraham and his son Ismail did centuries and millenniums ago. It's not something new whatsoever. In fact, it's a return back to the original form of worship and the original place of worship of the one God, the one God of Abraham, the God of all of the prophets. Once I presented this to the gentleman there in Canada, he was amazed. He was astounded. And he was looking at me like, I didn't know that. I, I, I didn't realize this. Then he turns and he says to me, you know what? This makes sense. This is exactly what I've always believed, that there's only one God. And He doesn't have partners. I don't believe in three gods or two gods. I don't believe in the Son of a God. I believe just in the one God. And I said, well, this is what we believe. He said, well, I believe in the God of Abraham. I said, this is what we believe. I said, now I have a question for you. Remember what I said in the beginning? If you heard yourself say, gee, I like this for me. Gee, this is what I already believed. Would you be prepared? Be prepared then to worship your God and my God, your Lord, my Lord, alone without partners. He goes, yeah. I said, okay. And that gave us an opportunity right then to ask him if he's prepared to enter into Islam by explaining now the details of what is Islam. We talked a little bit about, of course, the belief or the Akidah of Islam, and then we went to the five pillars of Islam. I explained to him that it, being a Muslim, you obey Allah, and one of the things Allah has asked us to do after entering into Islam, of course, is to make the shahada, give the statement of La ilaha illallah. None is worthy to worship except Allah and Muhammad or Rasulullah. That Muhammad is his messenger, and as such, I'm going to use him as my example and follow his teachings. Understanding that, then I know that I have to begin to pray five times a day, called Salawat al Khams, and I explained that to him. We talked about the fasting in Islam, that we have to, every year, fast the month of Ramadan. And then we talked about the zakah, and we spoke about the hajj to the bait of Allah, which is how the whole question came to begin with, talking about making this pilgrimage. And he asked me about that, and I said, the only ones who are allowed to make this pilgrimage are real Muslims. So the only way you could go there and really worship the Lord of the worlds is to be a Muslim. And he said, you know what, I really am ready to be a Muslim. 
and I understand it, I want to do it. So we gave him Shahada right there in front of the whole masjid there in Toronto, Canada. And he took his Shahada. He said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammadin abduhu rasul. I bear witness in open testimony. There's none to worship except the one almighty God. And he has no partners. And I bear witness in open testimony to the prophethood of all the prophets, starting with Adam and going to Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon them all. He said it. And what means that in Arabic? Ashadu la ilaha illallah, ashadu Muhammad rasulullah. Today, I'm happy to announce to you and report that this gentleman has become a very fine Muslim. He married one of our Muslim sisters from Somali, and together they're living a very good life as Muslims in Canada, helping other people to do what we're trying to do with our series right here, and that's to clear up these misconceptions and lift the fog that's been promoted out here about what is Islam and who are the Muslims. That's what our series is about. We hope you'll be back for more of this right here on Huda TV. This is something important for all Muslims to realize it's our obligation, it's our responsibility to lift the fog and let people see the real Islam on real, easy, simple terms. This is your host Yusuf Estes and it's my pleasure and privilege to be with all of you on these subjects. We've got a lot more right here on Huda TV. Stay tuned for more right here. Until next time, Salaamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.